Uh, we got to verse 6 last week. Um, where Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so we, we, we spent the latter half of last week looking at the word good and how it has been redefined as <clears throat> the devil. It's probably, it seems like it's his favorite tactic to redefine uh, words uh, in culture like the word good. So that when people talk about good and we talk about good, it's like there's this huge disconnect in it. And if his goal is truly achieved, that we don't even understand what the Bible means, what God means by the word good anymore. And um, If you find that in any way intriguing, I would highly recommend getting the teaching from last week. Um, because I was really blessed personally by that study as a reminder um, the Lord reminded me of so many things that have, in my, in my own understanding, have slipped by all of our cultural redefinitions that are constantly um, imposing upon us. So tonight, we're going to spend the first part of our time together considering the word work. Um, I apologize, this isn't my normal way of doing it to just focus on one word, um, but I feel like God wants us um, to spend a little bit of time on this. The reason being, verse 6 is is the, the by my um, perspective, there are three implications of what's going on here. So he says, um, being confident, Paul, confident of the Philippians and their fellowship in the gospel and the fact that Jesus is going to finish the work he started in, in them. What is this work, though? So three things <clears throat> that we're going to consider briefly about this. The first is that he does the work, he does the work in you. Uh, it's in the future active tense, and it's clearly um, implying that Jesus is the one doing the action, so he is working in you. Uh, interestingly enough, for those of you who really are into studying your Bible, this is not the only time in Philippians where he he implies this. Uh, it's really not an implication. It's kind of explicitly stated here that it's God that's working in you. Chapter 2 and verse 13 uh, he says again, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do, that he is working in you. And, and how so many Christians have had it wrong over the years, that it's, it's about our work for the Lord, that that is the, the, the primary element of Christianity, that we are working for the Lord. And it is not, not, not the primary um, implication or the primary element of Christianity. The primary element is that God works in you and then he works through you, and you work um, as he works through you. My favorite teacher, he always likened it when he was a lot younger and his kids were younger. He used to be out mowing the, the yard, and his youngest son would run out and say, Daddy, can I help you mow the yard? And he's like, yeah, sure. And so he'd, he'd grab the, that lower rung on the lawnmower, and he'd be pushing the lawnmower on the strip. But he's really not, you know. John's there pushing the mower, and his son's like, Daddy, look, I mowed a strip. And he's like, yeah, you did. You did a good job. But really, Dad did 99% of the work. And that's how it is with the Lord. But let me, let me just... Um, say one thing about this. Remember that the book of Philippians is the epistle of joy. And so everything we, we consider about the Philippi book of Philippians is going to um, uh, have implications or give us understanding about walking in joy and, and how much more joy. I have to tell you, I was one of those really miserable, sour Christians for the first five to eight years of my Christian life. Most of my Christian experience was very miserable and sour. And it was because I had some really bad teaching growing up. I didn't only grow up in Calvary. I also grew up in another um, mainline Christian denomination that really pumped your responsibility and, and really hardcore. And so I, I had some, when I got, when I really gave my life to the Lord at around 18, I had some fundamental misunderstandings about my responsibility as a Christian as I entered my Christian life. And so I thought so much more of it. I thought it was all about the work I did for God. And that is a very frustrating, very unjoyful place to be um, and how freeing um, and infusing it is with joy to understand that the, the primary element is, in Christianity is that it is God working in you. And when we get to chapter 2, verse 13, we're going to look at all of the really beautiful life-changing, incredible implications of that verse. But just to, to highlight this, uh, there, this is the epistle of joy. 
And twice in the epistle, in this very small book, he talks about and he highlights the fact that it is God working in you. The second thing about this idea of working, though, so he does the work in you. The second thing that we, we, uh, is of note in this verse, the implication in this verse, is that he does it your whole life. He is working in you your whole life. He is working in you your whole life. Thirdly, as, as you can imagine, it will, the third implication here is that it will, this work, though, will be done one day. And that is, that makes me happy. And you say, well, why would you be happy that God's work in you is going to be done? Well, let's go back to the second point for a little while. He does it, and he does it your whole life. And can I tell you at the outset of this point that the Christian life is far less God bringing your dreams to pass and far more him bringing his desires to pass in your heart than modern Christianity ever seems to imply nowadays. So much of what I hear um, when I turn on the radio, when I turn on and I hear the generic Christian music or I hear the popular Christian teachers is <clears throat> seems to give the implication that God almost exists just to bring your dreams to pass. And I'm sorry, that form of Christianity is really, really new and unbiblical. Um, that he, he in, to give any sort of implication that he exists, I'm, I'm obviously exaggerating it a little bit, though some people, you've got like people on the really far edge of that, like Blinky, who they literally would say that. Um, but <clears throat> the Christian life is far less about God bringing your dreams to pass and, and I might dare say that it's nothing about him bringing your dreams to pass, to be honest with you. Um, not that he doesn't want to bless you, not that he doesn't have great plans for your life, but there are some really wrong misunderstandings as a foundation to that statement. It's far less about God bringing your dreams to pass and far more him bringing his desires to pass in your heart. Because if he can change your heart, if he can mold you into the image of his son, he can make you, among other things, truly pleasing to him, fruitful garden that bears fruit out in the world. So, so get, this, get this down. The Song of Solomon harbors the, the meaning of life as the believer. And it's in, I believe, chapter four. And it talks about where the beloved comes to the Shulamite and he brings friends with him. And he starts talking about how she's a garden and how he's going to eat of her fruit. But then he, he also invites his friends to eat of her fruit as well. And the meaning of life as a believer is two part. The fruit that we bear is for enjoyment to God and for blessing our God's children and fellow, our fellow mankind. So the fruit that God desires that we bear is first and primarily to bless him and for his enjoyment, but then also to be a blessing and for the enjoyment and edification of the people around us. <clears throat> so he works on you and works on you and works on you day in and day out and day in and day out always always dare i say tinkering in the background he's always working he's all in everything that happens in your life all of the disappointments all of the frustrations all of the the things that don't work out the way you think they should, all of the, the waiting, all of the hardships. This is, this is why the third point is so encouraging that he will be, one, he will be done one day because this, this process of working in you is mostly about breaking and pressure and, and, and him breaking through. So three, three quick um, biblical pictures of why he does this and what he's doing. Let me read something that John Corson said on Jeremiah 18 real quick. So Jeremiah 18, you guys probably um, are aware of the passage if you're not aware of it by the, the address. Jeremiah 18 is the passage where God tells Jeremiah to go down to the house of the potter and to see what the potter's doing there. And you guys know he goes down to the house of the potter and he sees the potters at the work at work at the wheel and he's got his wheel spinning and he's got the clay in his hands and he's applying the pressure and God gives him this, this very dramatic prophecy. And this is what John says. He says, as the potter would pump the wheel with his foot, the clay went round and round and round and round just like life. And in the, in the teaching version of this, he shared an illustration, I don't remember who it's from, but someone once said that the problem with life is that it's so daily. 
that is just so daily. It's like round and round sometimes, round and round and round. You ever feel like your life is going in circles? Where am I going, we ask? Why isn't anything happening? Where is all this heading? Lord, I thought you loved me, but I only see myself going round and round and round and round. Then suddenly we feel his touch and are reminded of his presence. But as he begins to shape us, we become aware of his pressure. When we feel the pressure of life, the problems, trials, and struggles, if we're not careful, we can, we can say, that's enough, I've had it. Unlike literal clay, we have the ability to jump off the wheel and say, I'm tired of going round and round, I'm tired of the pressure, I'm, I'm going my own way, so we jump off only to splat on the ground. When we grow tired of being stepped on and walked over, finally we weakly, meekly say, Lord, pick me up again, and he does. He refashions us into a ball, plops us back on the wheel, and the process begins all over again. I'm convinced that many of us go through far too many cycles on the wheel because we give up at the very point where we're almost shaped up. We try to get out of our circumstances saying, no more, Lord, I've had enough. Finally, we begin to learn the secret of submitting. Have your way, Lord, we finally say. I'm tired of splatting. So the Lord spins us round and round in our daily circumstances, and then he begins to pressure us and shape us. After that, he turns on the heat of the kiln. That is why Peter would tell us not to be surprised by fiery trials. There's no way to make clay firm without fire. It's important maybe to remind us at this point, 2 Corinthians 4 has this to say. Verses 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. The Apostle Paul here is saying that you guys are probably, those of you who know me, one of my favorite passages of Scripture talking about death working in us, about all the hard things that Paul had brought in his life so that death would be working in him. And then he says in 4.12, therefore death works in us, but life in you. And that is the way of ministry, is the way of the cross. Spiritual life is only birthed, is only encouraged, is only strengthened in people through death in us. And then he says here, therefore we do not lose heart, even though all this death is working in us as ministers. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So if you guys are following what I'm saying, you're probably getting the picture that this Working that God does in us is largely hard things, unpleasant things, things that we wouldn't necessarily choose for ourselves. Um, but I want to look at three people really quick. I want to look at D Jacob, David, and Peter, because in these three people's lives, there are three distinct periods or three distinct messages. In one person, it's a period of their life, but in, in their lives, there are three dis very distinct thing go things going on that highlight what God was working at in their lives. And, and so firstly with Jacob, it is dependence is one of the main goals by my count. This is the opinion of Chris, just an opinion. But there are three main things in my opinion that God is trying to work, um, work into your life or work in your life to bring about as goals. And the first is dependence. And we've, if you've been here for very long, you've probably heard me harp on this, so I won't go there. I won't spend a lot of time there. But you have to understand, biblically speaking, and good biblical theology, that the main thing that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented in the garden was independence. And pretty much all conservative scholars agree on this, that the knowledge of good and evil, the opportunity to take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the opportunity to be your own lower G God. Your lesser, a lowercase God, the opportunity to call your own shots, to know, to have a sort of freedom to, to know good and evil. That's why it's good and evil, because it's dependence. You no longer need to depend upon that big meanie up on the sky um, for, for wisdom in life and, 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 and be afraid that he's holding things back from you that are enjoyable. You can call your own shots and be your own God. It is independence. That is the primary rep that is the primary thing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented is independence. So understand this, Christian. One of the primary things he is doing in a, on a daily basis in your life is bringing you to a point of greater dependence upon him, to a place of, of b before the fall where, where you have that sweet, um, simple dependence upon him. That is the truth that is the, the meta-narrative of 
of Jacob's life. You guys know that he was, his name was heel catcher, supplanter, conniver. He was born grasping his brother's heel. And he, he spent his early years trying to steal the birthright and the blessing from his brother through his intellect and his superior intellect, apparently. And then he, he runs away after he gets it because he finds out his brother wants to kill him. And then he, he ends up with probably the only person on the planet who's more conniving and shrewd than he is. And he swindles him nine ways to Sunday, you know, and gives him Leah instead of Rachel after working seven years, changes his, his, his wages and all of the things that Laban does to wear down his self-dependence. Jacob was self-dependent. He, didn't, he did not need God. So self-dependent was he that when God revealed himself to him at Bethel the first time on his way out, he says, and God kind of tells him what he wants to do, Jacob says, as I, he has the nerve to say to him, if you bring me back here, then I'll know that, then I'll serve you. If he put, like, don't do that. When you relate to God and you make it, don't put an if on God's part. That's really, really dumb and unwise. But he is so self-dependent. The only person in Jacob's life that is capable of bringing everything to pass that, that should come to pass is Jacob. So much so that when he relates to God the first time at Bethel, he says, if, he puts a big if in there. And so you guys know that he, he leaves Laban. Um, Rachel steals the house God, household gods. Laban follows him and, and wants to kill him and, and doesn't find the gods. But, but then basically says to him, you know, don't come back this way. If you come back this way, I'm going to kill you. And so he can't go back and he's heading home and he finds out that Esau is coming with him with a large cohort of men. And last time, last thing he heard some couple decades earlier, Esau wanted to kill him. Now he's got all of his family. He can't go back and he's got Esau coming to him. And so he makes camp that night. And what does he do? He goes across the stream to pray, to maybe meditate alone and think of a way out of this. And then what does God do? God maims him. He wrestles with him and dislocates his hip so he can't even run anymore. He can no longer be independent. He has no choice but to throw himself on the mercy of God and become dependent upon God. This is not like out there theology or doctrine. Jacob's life, there is a meta narrative to Jacob's life, and it is that if you want to be um, a prince with God, if you want to be um, submitted to God, God is doing this big work in Jacob's life over and over and over again. When you study it, you meditate on it, it becomes really clear that all of these things in Jacob's life, God is pressuring, working, moving, and he's doing all of these things to bring about greater dependence upon himself and less independence thwarted plans like malicious people all of these things to bring about less trust less dependence upon himself and greater trust and greater dependence upon god and mark my words christian in your life that boss that thwarts your efforts that 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 sibling that that old acquaintance that just seems to make things hard that that physical limitation that that thing that happened that seems to limit what you can do with your life you can look at those things as though they're random or you can see them for what they are they're god's hand in your life pressuring molding you into his image and making you what he wants you to be he is always working always working. Sometimes when you think he's working the least is when he's working the most. He's just not doing what you want him to do, which is, which is very short-sighted. Very often our goals, especially nowadays, are so short-sighted. You know, a, a house, you know, a nice house or, or, you know, some sort of version of the American dream. It's so short-sighted. So short-sighted. God has such long-term eternal goals for us. Secondly, David, I was meditating. I don't know why. I'm sorry. I, 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 sometimes I think I sound like a broken record. But do you guys ever like read the passage about David where he gets anointed by Samuel and just go, this is really odd. Not, not just the thing about the older brothers and God doesn't look at the outward appearance. Have you ever thought how odd it was that he got anointed by Samuel as king and then he didn't become king for over a decade? Like think about that for a minute. God told Samuel to anoint David as king. 
and then didn't actually make him king by some accounts for 14 years. Sounds like a lot of the rest of the Bible, right? A lot of the rest of the things that God seems to use very similar things, very similar pressures, very similar disappointments, very similar um, dynamics in our life. I'm sorry, that's odd. You can't look at it without, it without going, dude, God totally intended that the whole time. He actually, it wasn't like, oh, you know what? I know I just anointed him, but uh, I can't really bring it to pass because there are other things that are going to happen. That's not what was happening at all. God was working on David. You cannot read the Bible for very long before you look at passages like that and you come to the conclusion that God was up to something. He always has a plan. But when you read that, I can't get anything out of that 14-year delay other than God was working on David. Because I don't see where the 14-year delay was really great for the kingdom, to be honest with you. I don't see that Saul did great things or that Saul repented or that – I don't see any of that. Though there is an incredible picture of Jonathan and David um, where Jonathan is, Jonathan is a picture of Christ. Um, you know, he – when he he, he just he, – his heart is knit to David's. And what does he do? He gives David his – all of his royal garments and his, his – his, um, uh, uniform, basically. You know what he was saying? He was saying, you're the next king. You're the next king of Israel. But think about this. How did he give the kingdom to David? He gave the kingdom to David in his death. He was the son of the king, and he died to give the, king to, give the, the kingdom to David. He's a picture of Christ. But I don't think that's why the 14... He, God could have done that without the 14-year delay. The 14-year delay, I think Gene Edwards sums it up best in his... In his book, The Tale of Three Kings, he said, why did God allow the outer Saul to afflict and torment and harass David all of those years? It was to kill the inner Saul that lurked in the, the dark recesses of David's heart. You see, in every single one of us, there's a King Saul. And mark my words, given the right circumstances, the right opportunities, we would do all of the atrocious things that Saul did. It's in every human being. And Gene Edwards does such a good job of summing that up, saying the reason God allowed the outer Saul, the, the physical real Saul, to torment David like he did was to kill the inner Saul inside of David so that David wouldn't become a Saul. And yeah, we, we focus on David's big fall, but David had decades of righteous rule, and he was a good man. And be careful of judging him in his fall because none of us has any idea what it's like to be a, an ancient Middle Eastern king and the absolute freedom that came along with that. I promise you this too, if any single one of us was given even a, a hint of the absolute freedom that King David had, we'd be far, far worse kings. When the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart, if you've ever read that and been like, how could a man after God's own heart do the things that David did? Well, it's simple because he has a horribly vile sin nature just like all of us and he had absolute freedom or the closest thing to it that any of us could ever imagine. He had unlimited wealth, basically. He had unlimited societal power. He could do whatever he wanted to people without any repercussions. He, he was strong. He was powerful. He was well-liked. David had the closest thing to absolute freedom that a human, could be, a human being can have. And if you want to understand human nature, look at what one of the greatest men who's ever lived did when he had absolute freedom. That's more of a commentary on human nature than it is on King David. So waiting and running, waiting and being chased by Saul, those things were all part of that pressure that God's putting on the clay, on David's life, forming him into a godly man. Thirdly, I see Peter. I see the apostle Peter. And we talked about that. We just finished the book of Luke. I know that within three months ago, we actually went through this passage. But just a reminder, it's so startling, you know, when Jesus predicts Peter's betrayal. And Peter's like, you know, even if everybody denies you, I won't deny you. And Jesus says, Peter, before the rooster crows three times, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And then he says, and Satan has asked for you that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that you wouldn't stumble. That's not what he says. He doesn't say, I've prayed for you that you wouldn't stumble. He says, I prayed for you that your faith would remain. And when you come through it, strengthen your brethren. This is startling to me. Jesus didn't pray that Peter wouldn't fall. He knew the fall was inevitable. He didn't cause the fall. 
God just left him to his own devices. In your life, God is upholding you as a believer from sin. The Bible tells us that, that he can keep you from sinning. And he's upholding you from sin. So why do we at times find ourselves in bondage to something, even as believers? We find ourselves in bondage to a sin. You're like, I thought, God, you told me that you could, this is your fault. No, it's not his fault. What happened, and I'll tell you the truth here, what happened, I've seen it in my own life a handful of times over the years, is you got prideful, you started to think that your righteousness was based on you, and God said, um, so you're righteous because of your own effort? Okay. And he took his grace away from you. Not your salvation. He took his grace to uphold you away and left you to your own devices. And a fall is in short order left to your own devices. And that's what God did with Peter. He left him to his own devices and he fell. Second most startling thing about it, you guys know this. He never said to the apostle John, strengthen your brethren after the resurrection. He said it to the one who would fall. That's hardcore. You want to know the most strengthening thing? And I'm not encouraging you to fall. That's a stupid proposition, and it will not bring about these results if you choose it. The most strengthening thing that most that believers need to hear is, man, I blew it. When you've blown it, I blew it. And when I looked into his eyes, I saw grace. And he restored me, and he still loved me, even though I, even though I betrayed him. He still loved me. That's what a dying world needs to hear. That's what strengthens people. Not, yeah, if you could just be stronger like me and not fall behind like Peter, then you could probably be a Christian. If you could just live a more diligent, more disciplined life, then you could be a Christian. That's not only not biblical, that's not what people need to hear. What people need to hear is God's grace. That's why Jesus said, (laughs) he didn't say, I've prayed that you wouldn't stumble. He said, I've prayed for you that your faith would remain. You're going to get sifted. You're going to betray me. You're going to deny me. And I've prayed that your faith would remain. And when you've come through it, strengthen your brethren. What's he doing? He's working in you to make you useful. He allows incredible temptations. He allows even seasons where he takes his his grace away from you and you find yourself in bondage to something horrible because you were you were proud and you were puffed up thinking that you were righteous on your own effort even even as a believer and he leaves you to your own devices but even in that he is doing a work in you and we know we know that Jesus restored Peter on the on the on the edge of the sea of Galilee right and he comes to him and he says Peter you know he denied him three times right and he says Peter do you do you agape me do you love me absolutely? And Peter said, Lord, you know that I like you. You know I phileo you. You know in the Greek what's going on. I think most of you are aware of that, that Jesus says to him, Peter, do you agape me? Do you absolutely love me with God's love? And Peter, who had used the word agape before, said, Lord, you know I phileo you. You know it's a lesser form of love. You know I like you. And then Jesus asked him again and says, Peter, do you agape me? He says, Lord, you know I phileo you. you." And then he asks him a third time, but in the Greek, the third time he changed it, he said, Peter, do you phileo me? And he lowered it to Peter's level. And it says that Peter was grieved the third time he asked because he knew the, the implication that he had denied him three times and he was asking him three times and he had lowered it. And Peter said, Lord, you know I phileo you. What was God doing? The most, one of the most important things and most important prerequisites to ministry is that you see yourself clearly, that you see your shortcomings clearly. Otherwise, you will be tempted to draw people to yourself and say, if you could just be more like me, if you could just be more awesome like me, you could be super Christian like me. You're never going to hear that from me. I'm never going to try to, by God's grace, I'm never going to try and give you guys the implication or imply that I'm better than I am or stronger than I am. And and if you ever come across a teacher that does or a pastor or somebody, you need to shine that on and go somewhere else. God alone gets the glory. God alone upholds us. God alone is the one that, that can bring us through. So in Peter's life, we see this incredible heartbreak and failure. And even in that, we see God working to destroy self-confidence and to give him an accurate view of himself, two things that are absolutely necessary to being useful, that you be completely rid or almost completely rid of self-confidence and that you be, you have an accurate view of yourself and your limitations. 
God, God works in us. He's working in you daily, guys. He's working in us daily. And I have to tell you guys, there is so much more about the Christian life is about him working in you than it is about him accomplishing things for you or even through you. Yeah, that happens. He loves you. He's going to work on your behalf. He is going to accomplish things for you because he loves you. But that is not the highlight of the Christian life. That is not what we should be setting our minds on. When you read Andrew Murray, when you read A.W. Tozer, when you read these, these people from 50 years ago, 70 years ago, Spurgeon, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, do you know that what's patently missing in their writings is anything that sounds even remotely like the modern prosperity, like God's going to bring your dreams to pass. You know what they were always writing about is what God's doing in your life now and how he's molding you and what's happening in your life. And they were looking at their spiritual life and seeing the changes and seeing the growth and looking for the growth and talking about the growth and, and the work that God was doing in them. And I'm sorry, that has been very lacking. It's been dissipating in Christianity to our incredible detriment. So Philippians, back to Philippians 1. move on verse 7 just it is right for me to think this of you and we already kind of covered this verse last week just as it is right for me to think of this of you all because I have you in my heart in as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel you all are partakers of me with grace for God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ and this I pray that your love may still may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. So I want to say this. Um, here we get one of Paul's prayers, and he does this throughout the epistles. I've kind of lost count. It's somewhere upwards of eight prayers that Paul says, I pray this for you. Um, there are, there's one explicitly in the book of Ephesians. Um, there are actually two in Ephesians because Paul says what he prays for them in Ephesians 1, but then he tells them to pray for him in Ephesians 6. So you get two in Ephesians, and you've heard me pray both prayers if you've been here for a while. Um, the one in Ephesians 6 is pray for me that, I may, that boldness may be given to me and I may be able to speak boldly as I ought to speak and make known the mystery of the gospel. That's Paul's request that they would pray that for him in Ephesians 6. Ephesians 1, the prayer is um, that I pray for you that he might give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of himself, that the eyes of your understanding would be open, that, that you would know what is the hope of your calling and what is the exceeding greatness of his power that works in you. What a great prayer to pray for people. Colossians 2, I, I, that, I, that you would be, I pray this for people all the time, that you would be rooted and built up in, in him, established in the faith, abounding in it with thanksgiving as you've been taught. Um, we could just go on. You should be, let me tell you this, Christian who's been walking with the Lord for a while, you should know biblical prayers. You should know the Apostle Paul's prayers because they are treasures. Because I think a lot of people, it's been my experience as a pastor and things people have said to me over the years, a lot of people don't know how to pray. We get all caught up in this kind of like God's sovereign. How do I pray for this person? He knows what's wrong with him. He knows my heart. He knows what's going on. Dude, just pray one of the biblical prayers that the Apostle Paul prayed. Just pray it for him, you know? It's so incredible. And here we have a prayer that he, prayed for the, that he prayed for the Philippian church. And I encourage you to memorize the prayers. You don't have to, I screwed up the Ephesians one while. If anybody looked at Ephesians one, you know that I missed words and stuff. That doesn't matter. You get the point of it. You, you memorize it and you understand what it's saying and the implications of it. And I'm telling you, it's impossible to go wrong praying for somebody when you're praying scripture. When you're praying prayers from the scripture, and we see here, here's a prayer that you could memorize and you could be praying for, for anyone, any believer. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. And I pray this for you guys, that your love may abound still more and more in all knowledge, in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You know, there's... Jesus taught us to pray. You guys hear me pray parts of the, of the Lord's prayer, that he would lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil and that his kingdom would come in all of its fullness and that you would, you would give to us our daily bread. And, and I'm just, I'll, I'll end there, but I'll tell you, if you find yourself going, I just don't know what to pray for people, shame on you. <laughs> or maybe you didn't know. Well, now you know. There are a lot of prayers that are written down in scripture, not just the Lord's prayers. The epistles are, are peppered with them. 
absolutely peppered. There are so many. I challenge you guys to look them all up. There's one in Thessalonians that I memorized a long time ago, and I can't quote it now, but it was a really, really good one. and just came back to mind. <clears throat> three things he prayed for them here in the, in, in the beginning of it, that their love, three things for their love that he prayed, that it would abound more and more, that their love would abound more and more. Secondly, that it would be knowledgeable, interesting. And thirdly, that it would be exercised in discernment, that it would be exercised in discernment. Interesting. What does it mean by that? What does it mean by that? That it would be exercised in knowledge and all discernment. Well, thankfully, verse 10 starts out with the word that. So it tells us what that means. It says that. So it says that your love, um, sorry, and, I, and this I pray that your love would may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. That, that. So here we have four, four ways that love can be exercised in knowledge and discernment. How do you love in knowledge and discernment? So firstly, firstly, in verse 10, you need to discern whether the cause is excellent or not. You must discern whether the cause is excellent or not. That you may approve the things that are excellent. Does anybody... And I'm not really looking for a show of hands, but does anybody else in here feel like a really, really strong cultural pressure to approve all of the lifestyles of other people? Like, why do I have to prove everybody else's lifestyle? Why can't you just live and let live? And I get it. So we have voting in our, we're, we're a democracy, we have voting. And so there's a, there's a large amount of it is in the voting direction, right? It's like, if we can get political change, we can get our cause across, we can have all of our freedoms and, and this, that, and the other. Though nowadays, everybody has the same amount of liberty, basically. And it's not really about having equal liberty. Those subgroups are actually looking for special favor now. But there is this cultural pressure that I have to approve of everybody else's lifestyle. No, I don't. I don't have to approve of everybody else's lifestyle. And I get it. I get it. They're looking for approval in the form of voting. But we have to be careful as Christians because I can't do that. I can't, I cannot do that. Jesus tells me I have to stand for him and I have to stand for to, truth and I have to tell people the truth. There are so many people that want us to approve things that are not excellent in God's eyes. So many people that want us to approve things that are not excellent in God's eyes. Oh, well, we love each other. We're not hurting anybody. Well, how could you not uh, approve of, of my lifestyle? I'm not hurting anybody. It's... It, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, that's only one of the definitions of sin is that it damages and it destroys. And I apologize if you've heard this illustration, but I have to give it again whenever I broach this subject because it, it, it highlights the error in that thinking. I was praying once in my, in my Alicia's office and um, before a teaching a long time ago, like seven, eight years ago, and I was, sorry, lose my reward. I was on my face on the ground in the office just praying before a teaching and our cat walked in the room and laid down next to me. And so I'm like sitting there and I have my face turned to the side and I see him and he lays down right in front of my face and begins to lick his rear end. And so I'm like, oh, dude, get away from me, you know. And so I like push him away and I turn the other way and I'm praying. And uh, I have my eyes closed and then I feel it, that raspy tongue on my cheek. He just licked his rear end, okay. And I'm just like, I'm going to like go bathe. <sighs> to my cat, it comes perfectly natural to do something that to me is utterly vile. He, he, he cleans himself. He licks, they, they lick their butt. But he cannot approach me. He cannot attempt to come up. And I don't know if you know this, but one of the, the version, one of the definitions of worship is to turn and to kiss. He cannot come worship me with those lips and that tongue. He cannot adore me. He cannot love on me because that's vile to me. And if you're tracking, hear me on this because this is the fundamental problem with all of those lifestyles that are pressuring us to accept them and say, well, we just love, we're not hurting anybody. And there, there's some truth to that. They're really not hurting anybody, basically. I get that. 
We're not hurting anybody. That being said, though, God is disgusted by that thing, and I have to stand with him. I am his child. He's told me that this thing disgusts him. And as natural as it may seem to that person, as much as that person may say, I'm not hurting anybody, and this just comes naturally to me, it is disgusting to him. And he will not accept it. And so I have to stand my ground with him, whether I like it or not, even though it will make me culturally unpopular for a large, to a large segment of the population. I'm sorry, I can't approve of that. I'm sorry, I can love on you. I'll come over, I'll, I'll help you through life. I'll do whatever, but I cannot approve of that lifestyle even though you want me to because it is not righteous. It is not okay in God's life. Even though you're not hurting anybody. I get that, you're not hurting anybody. That's fine. You're just doing your own thing. That's fine. The problem is, is that you cannot approach God that way. He says it's disgusting no matter how natural it comes to you and how inoffensive it seems to every other human being. To him, it is completely vile and unacceptable. This generation so reminds me of the, the whole thing with Ahab and Jehoshaphat in 1 Kings 22. Um, you don't have to turn there, though I am going to read a swath of it. Um, just because it is our culture to a T. It's incredible. Now, three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. That's Israel, the northern kingdom. At this point, Israel and Judah. Israel is not one kingdom, it's two. It's Israel is the northern kingdom and Judah is the southern kingdom. And then Syria is the nation to the north of the northern kingdom. So now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, that's the, the bottom half of Israel, went down to visit the king of Israel. Now the reason it says down, even though he's going up, is because when you leave Jerusalem, you always go down in Jewish thought. And the king of Israel said to his servants, do you know that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, but we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? So he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses, we're all Jewish. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, that's to Ahab, this horrible dude, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Then Jehoshaphat said, is there, he must have had something like, uh, this doesn't seem right. Uh, but he said, and Jehoshaphat said, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man, Micah, Micaiah, the son of Imia, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, bring Micaiah, Micaiah the son of Im Imia, quickly. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, having put all on their robes, sat each on his throne at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of Kenna, that's a lot of A's. Kenana made horns of iron for himself and said, thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so saying, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah <clears throat> spoke to him saying, now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord, encourage the king, please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. And Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Then he came to the king and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall we refrain? And he answered him, go and prosper for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. So the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Then Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in this manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. 
Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Now, Zedekiah, the son of Kenana, Kenana, can't, whatever, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, which way did the spirit from the Lord go to me, go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, indeed, you shall see on that day when you go to an inner chamber to hide. So the king of Israel said, take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction, and is like, come in peace. But Micaiah said, if you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, take heed, all you people. And so Ahab goes. He thinks he's going to be clever. He changes his, his garments and doesn't go as the king, and he dies in battle. Now, I know this is one of the trickiest passages in Scripture. It's not why we're here tonight. I'm not going to delve into all of the, the interesting things about the passage of Scripture, except to say this. On the really general sense... This culture is just like Ahab and Jehoshaphat by, by association saying, tell us good things. Tell us, uh, uh, you know, approve of our lifestyle and tell it's okay. And we're like, I really can't. Your lifestyle is, it, it is actually destroying you. And it's, it's destroying your ability to have healthy relationships. And it's destroying your ability to stand before God when you die and be judged favorably. I can't do that. It's not loving. I have to tell you the truth. They say, no, tell me lies. Tell me. Love, the love, how do we love in a discerning way? We have to approve only the things that are excellent. Otherwise, it's not love. If you approve things that are really actually bad for people, that's not love. That's not genuine love. We must love in a discerning way. Secondly, verse 10 of, of Philippians 1 <clears throat> that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Secondly, you must discern whether your action offends. It is really, really hard to be loving as a Christian if you're destroying your brother or sister in Christ, if you're offending them. I don't feel like we have time to go all the way through the passage tonight in Romans 14. Um, I'm just going to read briefly from it, and you can check it out later if you want to. But Romans 14, the Apostle Paul is talking about Christian liberty, eating meat offered to idols, or, or um, non-kosher meat, you know, bacon and things like that. And then, you know, should you drink alcohol, should you not drink alcohol? Um, and he's talking about Christian liberties, the things that we have the ability to do. And he's talking about the fact that we have to filter our Christian liberties through love for our brother. And what that means is even though I personally have the liberty to drink, it just doesn't, it's never been a strong temptation for me. Um, I don't drink. Because the truth is, is that if I as a pastor drink and say I go out with a, you know, you guys and we go out on after the thing on Friday nights and go out to Chili's or whatever and I order something. The danger is, is, as you guys know, there could be someone that has just come into the group that maybe has been clean for five or five months or five years or 10 years. And, you know, they, they're, they've gone to AA and they've gotten on the wagon and they're doing the whole thing. And then they go, oh, wait, the pastor drinks. Maybe as a Christian, I can drink and it'll be okay. And it'll be a new thing to me. And this, I don't even know how many times this has happened over the centuries that some pastor or some person in leadership or maybe even just a, a Christian, because it's not only to people in leadership, to be honest with you. I've seen it work itself out not in leadership too, where just people in a group like this have a liberty and they're like, oh, dude, it's, this couldn't possibly stumble anybody. Something silly, not even as like strong as drinking. And I've seen it practically destroy people because someone has a, con a really strong, maybe self-imposed conviction about something and it, and it just can devastate them. But, but you know, you can go out, have a few drinks and that person who, who just has that weakness towards alcohol is born and goes, yeah, maybe I have a new life in Christ and I can just enjoy this in liberty and not be ruled by it. And then they go down that road and it just destroys them and it has destroyed countless people. <clears throat> And so the Apostle Paul says of that here, he says in Romans 14, 
For I know I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything unclean, to him it is unclean. So what he's really talking about there is like the, the unkosher meat, like pork, that the, the people who were raised Jewish who had never had any form of pig or anything like that, they would have looked at those things as unclean. And they, to them, maybe they just can't get over it. And so they actually, there are people that there's something that's totally clean, like pork, but if they eat it, it, it just totally screws up their conscience and they go into a downward shame spiral and it just tears them up. Something is silly it seems as silly to us as eating bacon that we can't even imagine somebody wouldn't have the liberty to do. Yet if your brother is grieved, verse 15, because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, getting your own thing and and, and living a pleasurable life, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things which, uh, by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the one who eats with offense, who is offended when they eat. It is, <clears throat> it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not of faith is sin. You must discern when you want to love people. It is not I personally, I, you know, I hear of from time to time of the pastor, I just go out to the bar on the weekends and I have this bar ministry. I'm literally talking about somebody here who actually, I think it was pizza and beers or whatever. And they went to a pizza place that had alcohol and they would meet non-believers and they had a set time where non-believers could have a pizza and a beer with the pastor and discuss questions. And it was this whole outreach. I have to tell you, Biblically speaking, I have a hard time seeing that as genuinely loving and a knowledgeable and a discern, in a discerning way because it, dis- it probably destroys as many people as it helps. And you don't have to have a beer in your hand to be relatable to people. Does the action offend? Does it destroy? Thirdly, in verse 11, is the act of love righteous? Is the act of love righteous? Philippians 1.11 <clears throat> being filled with all being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God is the act this act of love righteous i was reminded of the the verse in judges 16 verse 4 where it says and samson loved a woman in, of the philistines and her name was delilah i think a lot of christians we get on this kick at least in the youth group age where we're like, oh, that's not love, it's lust, you know? And I've, I've literally known Christians who are like, non-believers can't even love. And I'm like, what? What? That's so dumb. Like, you don't have to be a Christian to love. Like, there are a lot of non-believers that love and experience real love and give of their lives and live, and live um, you know, have great marriages their whole lives. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But this idea that is this act of love righteous, Samson genuinely loved Delilah. I think Delilah genuinely loved money. I don't think she ever really loved Samson. You can kind of judge that for yourself from the passage. But is the act of love righteous? Oh, but we love each other. But we love each other. We're not hurting anybody. Yeah, but is that right before God? Is what you're doing right before God? We must love as Christians in righteousness. And you can look at Samson's life. Pretty much everybody got destroyed in that story. And that, that stories just like that have played themselves out how many, I don't even know how many times with this, he fell in love with her, she fell in love with him. And, oh yeah, you know, we're not really loving. We, we live together. It's okay. We, we, you know, we, yeah, we, we've slept together a few times, whatever, but it, but we love each other. No, no, in God's economy, you, it must be um, righteous. It must be righteous. Otherwise people are really genuinely going to get burned. It'll be a real hair-raising story in the end. Fourthly, in verse 11, and finally, this is our final point that has some sub-points, but does it glorify God? 
does it glorify God? This love, our love must glorify God. Are you loving people to make them love you? Let me ask you that question. Are you loving people, being nice to people, acting loving, maybe even convincing yourself you're loving them to get them to love you? You see, the people that pressure us in this culture to accept them and to, to shower them with ignorant love and acceptance, which is not really love, but it's a, a form of love, the pressure is, if you love me, I'll love you. If you're nice to me and you give me what I want, I'll, I'll be nice to you and I won't pressure you and I won't... I won't put your bakeries out of business and I won't do whatever. I I won't, I'll stop trying to take your freedoms away because I'm not getting my, my special, um, sort of indulgences. As we finish, turn with me to second Samuel 15. I just have a, a few really important points. I think that God wants us to just kind of look at. How do you know? How do you know if you as a Christian have been hoodwinked or hoodwinked yourself into this self-loving form of love where you, you love yourself and you sort of love other people, but it's really a manifestation of self-love. And I, I remember that, what was that one really stupid song that came out like, 10 years ago with the line, one of the lines in the first verse the guy says to the girl is I've decided you'd look well on me <laughs> do girls really fall for that I mean I know they do I know some do maybe they're not listening to that line what that's self love that's not love that's self love like and he's so oblivious that he actually put that in the song like, I've, yeah, it's all about me. I've decided that you'd look good on me. You're really just an apparatus, a part of my life. You're just, you'd be a nice addition to my life, to the It's All About Me show. How do you know? Because here's the, here's the sad truth. The sad truth is this, this, this um, leaven, and it's so, um, it's in everything. It's, it's endemic in our culture. It's in every single one of us. It's in every single one of us. I want to give you six little snapshots of what it looks like when you really love yourself but you're pretending to love other people because I think this is really important. We, I'm pretty sure every single one of us needs to purge some or all of this out of our lives. So what does it look like to love yourself and pretend to love other people as a manifestation of that self-love? Well, we're going to go to the king of it. We're going to go to Absalom, David's son, the self-righteous son who murdered Amnon for raping his sister. Absalom, it says, was the best looking dude in the whole country. And it said his hair was so prolific that they had to cut it each year and they actually weighed it because there was so much of his hair. But he was really mad at his dad for not taking care of the, the whole issue with Amnon raping Tamar and him having to take matters into his own hand. And then he had to live in exile for a number of years and the whole thing just falling apart, broken family to the max. Well, Absalom has now decided that dad is not fit to rule the kingdom and he's going to take it from him. And so it says here, Second <clears throat> Samuel 15, after this it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision that Absalom would call to him and say, what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good and right, but there's no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that I were made judge in the land and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me, then I, could, then I would give him justice. And so it was whenever anyone came near to bow down to him that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Now it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said to the king, please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to the Lord. For your servant took a vow while I dwelt in, at Geshur in Syria, saying, if the Lord indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said to him, 
go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with, Ab- and with Absalom went 200 men invited from Jerusalem, and they went along innocently and did not know anything. So six, six questions, six signs that you are a self-lover. Firstly, is preoccupation with what people think of you. Are you preoccupied with what people think of you? Does it make you anxious, keep you up at night, make you mean, make you say hurtful things, make you gossip? If you are preoccupied, maybe it's none of the more hurtful things. Maybe you are just preoccupied with what do people think of what I said? What do people think of what I wore? What do you think of, what do people think of what at work? If you are preoccupied with yourself, that's a manifestation of self-love. Plain and simple. It is one of the fundamental causes of anxiety is preoccupation and self-love. It's one of the benefits of caring less and less and less about yourself and letting God destroy your self-love. It just makes you happier and less anxious. So the first sign that you actually have a a love that's really, it seems altruistic, but it's really a fake love, it's a self-love, is that you're preoccupied with what people think of you. And we see there in 15.1 that Absalom, because he was absolutely preoccupied with what people thought of him and had to win the hearts of the people, provided 50 men to run before him in horses and chariots. Secondly, and we see it there in 15.1, is spending a lot of money and striving to get that money because you care so much about what people think about you. Absalom, that's his, he had to pay these guys. This is a lot of money. Now, he may have had the money. He may have had to work for the money. I'd imagine he had the money because it's a lot of money and he was the king's son. Spending a lot of money because you care too much what people think about you. Is it, are, are all the choices you make really about what people think about you? Like the car you drive, is it really the car that you love just because you love it? Or do you drive the vehicle you drive because everybody else likes it, but really you'd rather have something that nobody likes? I know that's simple, but do, is there areas of your life where you look at your life and you're like, dude, actually I, I spend a lot to look good. And who cares? Who, who really cares what people think about me and whether I'm... <clears throat> You guys are probably looking at me like, dude, you could spend a little bit more, but I... it's so freeing. So thirdly, thirdly, in verse two, now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. You publicly, subtly let people know how much you give and how much you sacrifice and how devoted you are. Oh, I rise early. Oh, I, oh, I only rose at four this morning to do my Bible studies to do my devotions. I only rose at four this morning to go serve that widow down the street. I only, I only rose at three this morning to go do that, that service. And you're subtly letting people know how great you are. That's a manifestation of self-love. What did Jesus say? He said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't sound a trumpet before you in the streets. Absalom was a little more subtle than the trumpet, but he was letting people know how devoted he was and how hardworking he was and how sacrificial he was. But let me, let's be really clear. Well, we'll get there. I'm going to bleed into a later point. If everything you do that's altruistic or genuinely for other people has to be, there has to somehow it become known that you did it or that there's this devotion, that's self-love. And you might be fooling yourself a little bit with how loving you really are. Fourthly, in 15.3, we see him twisting facts. Really, this is, these are bold-faced lies. But twisting facts to advance his own cause. Do you find yourself in your life twisting facts, twisting lying to make people like you or get what you want from people, from life? That's an evidence that you don't actually love people. You love yourself. 15.3, then Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Really? Yeah, there was. He was lying. 
He was lying to people because he loved himself, not because he loved them. He was pretending to love them. And I know that, and we'll get to it as our sixth point. But twisting facts to advance your own cause. Fifth, fifthly, in verse 5, we see his false humility. And so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, they say, oh, no, 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 you don't have to bow. Let me, let me greet you with a hug and a kiss. Uh, you don't have to bow. False humility. Oh, it's just brother Absalom, not King Absalom, not, not the son of the king. It was false humility. Do you find yourself pretending to be lower than you really think you are and pretending to elevate people up that you really despise and couldn't care less about? because you need something or you want something, you have some sort of ambition, that's false humility. Sixthly, and finally, in 10 through 11, we see that Absalom didn't give a rip about these people. He literally endangered these 200 men in verse 11 that went with him innocently to Hebron. He didn't care a whit about the people that he was trying to win their hearts. He only cared about himself. These 200 men stood a good chance of dying and they had no idea. And he didn't care at all because all Absalom cared about is himself. If you're really honest with yourself, is there like, say, a ministry you've been a part of? And you really realize that you don't care about the people in the ministry. They, they don't actually mean anything to you. It's just this ministry is a stepping stone to another ministry. Or this, this ministry is really just to get people to like me, to, to get followers on some sort of social media or to get popularity or to, to gain something or get somewhere. That's a sign of self-love. He didn't actually care about the people. And, and I challenge you, I ch not, not that I necessarily think that's anyone in here, but these six indicators indicate self-love, not selfless love, real love. If, if that is you though, if that, and I don't think that is anybody in here, but if that is, you will fail them <laughs> as Absalom did, caught up by his pride, his hair literally caught up in a tree, the, the, the mark of his gorgeousness and his amazingness literally caught in an oak tree and he was hung from the tree by his hair and they came and speared him. He literally failed and caused the death of all of these people that bought his lies and his falsehoods. He failed them and destroyed them. It's so important, guys, that our love glorify God, not bring glory to ourselves. And there are a lot of people that love, that look like they love, and a lot of Christians that look like they love, but they're really just doing acts of kindness or goodness or devotion, sacrifice, because they love themselves. And God knows. God help us that we would purge our hearts of the self-love. Because it is so important that the love that we show other people drives them to him, not to us. Not to us. I cannot really help people. It was a long time ago. And I remember when that sunk in for me as a youth pastor some 10 years ago when I started to realize and become overwhelmed because I was trying to help the world and I thought a lot of it was me helping. And you, you just have 30, 40 kids and you can't even solve one of their problems. You can't stop that kid's dad from beating his mom. What are you gonna do? You say something about it, the likelihood is that he's gonna beat her worse. How do you actually solve something? Only Jesus can solve that. I can't solve this kid's problem where his dad's dying of cancer. I can't do that. You are not the answer to people's problems and don't ever let the devil convince you that you are. In that self-love form of ministry where people are doing nice things and, and working hard really to bring glory to themselves, it only destroys people. It destroys people in large swaths. The leader always fails and dies and gets hung up in their pride just like Absalom did. But inevitably, a lot of people get hurt along the way just like all of those people that foolishly followed him. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask that you would purge, touch on our hearts, Lord, where those things are embedded in each of us, Lord, and help us, Lord, by your grace to rid those things from our hearts that we would love only to bring glory to you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this evening, and I pray that you would bless it to our hearts. I pray that you bless our day tomorrow, bless our fellowship, keep everyone safe, and um, we love you, Lord, and thank you for all of your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen.